All right, here we go. Biggs, welcome back. What's up, fam? Good to be back. Yeah, everything good, man. It's good running into you mm -hmm. at uh, Complex Con. Yeah. Yep, and you know, you're introducing, well, reintroducing the Rockefeller Air Force One. Yeah, man. It was good to bring that back out, man. It's, uh, uh, it's something that the people wanted, so it was uh, a sneaker that was uh, highly coveted uh, and one of the highest selling on the resale market. So, you know, got the call and then um, it made sense to put it together. Well, how did the original Rockefeller Air Force One come together? Um, they reached out to us um, to do a friends and family. So it was on, I can't even remember how many pairs. I think it was only maybe 150 or, or less. And um, <clears throat> obviously the bulk of that going to Jay Damon and myself. And um, the sneakers somehow got out there. And, you know, uh, once Nike reached out to me to, to do this re-release, I didn't even know that it was going on a resale market uh, for the price that it did. So, uh, you know, back then it was just something that uh, Nike thought wanted to show um, an allegiance with Rockefeller and recognizing what we did for the Air Force One and being a sneaker that we wore almost every day for five or six years. Right, yeah, because I remember at one point the Air Force One was just ubiquitous. It's like everybody had to have one. Yeah. I mean, we used to call it the Air Force Once because you'd wear them once. And then <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's why they call them ones. Yeah, one and done. <laughs> one and done. So you guys would do that. You guys would wear them once and then just toss them. Yeah, one, one, yeah, one time and done. We was buying a hundred at a time, man. Okay, yeah, this is this is some Clark Kent shit. I guess that rubbed, <laughs> rub, rubbed off on y'all with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was definitely okay. the, he was definitely one of the first sneaker collectors I knew. Uh, you know, early on, you know, we bought sneakers. Uh, well, I wouldn't say collector because uh, Clark buys and wears his sneakers. Um, the same thing we did, but I mean, up until knowing him, I didn't know anybody else with that amount of sneakers that owned that, that many. Like, he had rooms that weren't bedrooms. They were just housing sneakers. Right, but when you say he wears his sneakers, he doesn't wear them like normal human beings <laughs> wears sneakers. He wears them one time and then gets rid of them forever. Yeah. yeah. And he would buy multiple pairs of the same shoe so he could wear it on multiple days. Yeah. I mean, like, it, it's really, like, I, fresh. I, I don't get it, man. Clock is fresh. I mean, what you what can you say? He's a dude <laughs> that like to stay, you know what I mean? He stays yeah, sourced Yeah, I up. mean, that's a new type of fresh, but yeah. hey, you know? <laughs> I, I mean, is this, a, is this a New York thing? Like, where did this even come from? Well, I'm not sure. Well, he's from Brooklyn. He's been doing it, right? Um, this is something that happened in Harlem once somebody called me out. Um, God bless uh, my friend uh, Ali Mo. Uh, he had noticed a scratch on my sneakers and, and was making fun of me. So I told him, uh, you know, I was like, okay, catch me tomorrow. And that tomorrow turned into about six or seven years where I never wore the same pair of sneakers again. Right, because I remember, I think, I think me and Bleak talked about this when we interviewed. But he used to say, like, when he was broke in the projects, he used to have to, like, you know, scrub his, his sneakers, mm -hmm. you know, with a, with a toothbrush. And yeah. this was, like, like, a fate worse than death, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. to him. And to me, I'd been doing that shit my whole life. So I was like, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't get what he's even talking about right now. Like, mm -hmm. how, how is this even all that bad? But I guess for, for like, you know, people in your, you know, in your crew, this is, like, a real, a real thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it just caught on fire. And like God, like I said, guys stayed fresh. Jay, Dame, and myself, we were real competitive on how we looked, what we did, how we dressed, you know. So, you know, all of it, it just, it all rubbed off. So, you know, we were guys that we, you know, we wanted to come out and be flying in each other every day. Okay, like who usually won? Me. <laughs> 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 no, nah, every, uh, every, everybody, so everybody did their thing. Everybody did their thing. Uh, okay, so <laughs> so you guys re-released the, uh, the Rockefeller Air Force One, and how much was the the original hundred or so pair selling for? If you can get a pair, um, I think it, it it reached a high over twenty thousand dollars. Twenty thousand dollars. Yeah. Did you have any of the original pairs yourself? Yeah, of course, I had the original pair. That's so why I was saying earlier that me, Jay, and Dame had the bulk of you know, the Air Force Ones from the friends and family. 
Okay, but no, I'm saying, but you still kept them. Like to this day, you still have the original, yeah, yeah, some yeah. Of the original batches. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay, so they go and re-release them, and do you know how many pairs they actually re-released? Uh, no, I, you know, we don't release like numbers or anything like that, but it was a worldwide uh, release. It was one of the biggest release uh, for this, this pack that just came out. Right, because it crashed the Nike app. Twice. Twice. Right, because besides you guys, the only ones that crashed the Nike app were the Virgils. Yeah, exactly. The, the off-whites. Yeah. And, you know, that's a, that's a pretty high bar to, to be right along with. I mean, it's a blessing. Tr- truthfully, I didn't, I didn't know, you know, I know, well, I knew that we would do well. I didn't know it would just be devoured in one day worldwide. So whatever sneaker stores have them now, they probably just held some back. Um, I'm hearing that a few people did and they're releasing, you know, like pairs. Uh, they released a few a week later or two weeks later. But I didn't know it was going to be going to have, um, you know, worldwide, like people, Europe, Japan, you know, Singapore, you know, all over Asia, UK, um, clamoring for the sneaker. You know, I, it's, 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 it's a huge blessing, man, that people really still hold the rock at high esteem like that. Yeah, I mean, I mean the name, the name is carrying on. I yeah. mean, between Rock Nation and, you know, like, it's interesting when you see like a Yo Gotti wear a Rockefeller chain. Yeah. You know, where it's like he has nothing to do with, you know, what originally it was part of, but yet it's seen as a sign of prestige to this day. Yeah, 100%. So that, that Rockefeller chain isn't, I mean, it's the logo, right? But that logo is more, that's besides Jay Damon, myself, is all the people that helped build that. So it's not, it's not the name anymore. That logo I, I talk about a lot. That, that, that's etched on our hearts. That's the honor, the loyalty, um, the brotherhood, the camaraderie that we built. So people want to buy into that, whether it's uh, a, you know, having that logo on, but it might be something that represents what they do with their crew as well. You know, so even Fabulous. Fabulous just got one for his birthday, too. Oh, right. I saw that. I saw the yeah. video. So I'm saying I love it. You know, you see Khaled with it, Yo Gotti, right? Uh, Fabulous. So to see the next generation um, still carrying on that flame, you know, for what Rockefeller meant, that's a great blessing to all of us. No, absolutely. Now, you had your own Air Jordan 4 as well? Yeah. Now, was that an actual Air Jordan or was it a custom? No, that's a that's a that's an Air Jordan. That's mine though. So those aren't out yet. They're they're no one can get those. So you know, I'm I'm lucky to have those uh, by myself. Right. So it's like the it's like black and white, right? Yeah. There's a one, okay. a four, and a uh, and an Air Force One, all reasonable doubt um, themed. Aha, aha. But you're the only one that has them. Yeah, I'm the lucky one. Okay, are they planning on actually releasing those the same way as the uh, Air Force Ones? Um, I can't talk about that yet. You know, there's other things that's being discussed. But the people want it, so, you know, we can see what happens. Were you involved with Kanye when he did his deal with Nike originally? No. Okay. When you, when you look at that situation, right, and, you know, you just did, you know, a, a deal with, with Nike, but when you looked at when Kanye was at Nike, why do you think Nike let him go? I'm really not sure. Um, when seriously, but um, what, what did it, what exactly did he do? Like bring me up to speed. What did Kanye do with Nike? Well, he had the Yeezys, the Air Yeezys. Mm, I, truthfully, I can't even remember what, what they look like. Anything like when you talk about Yeezy, I'm thinking about uh, obviously everything that he's doing now. Um, okay, let me show you. Um, the Nike Air Yeezys actually have a higher resale than the, uh, you know, than the Adidas. Well, let me, let me see if I can show you here. The Red Octobers, this doesn't sound familiar to you? They do sound familiar, but I can't. Okay. For some, I don't, I don't know if I've ever seen those though. You've never seen these? Yeah. Okay, hold on. But the, the Red October sounds familiar. Yeah, he had, well, he had two. He had a Yeezy 1 and a Yeezy 2. This is the Yeezy 1. Okay. See how, see how's that strap? Yeah, yeah. The strap was kind of like the, the Nike Yeezy thing. Yeah. 
You know, and those it look kind of hot. A couple different colors. Here's the, you know. Yeah, I like those black like ones. I, I, I need, I need, I need a pair of those. You got those? Send me up. a pair. I don't got those. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got most of the. Well, I got most of the the Adidas Yeezys. Like, you know, like the high tops and the low tops. Yeah. You know, like the first the first season. But those, yeah, I didn't I didn't cop those. Those go for about three grand. But okay, so so what happened was, he had a deal with Nike, and he had these Yeezys that came out, in a, you know a few different colorways of the one, like maybe three colorways of the one, three colorways of the two, but they came out in such unbelievably small quantities that, that there's you could not go into any store and buy them. Like, you know, it was like a couple thousand pairs that just like, poof, yeah, came and went. And, you know, obviously, I mean, I assume he got some sort of upfront check for that, but there's really no royalties when you're talking about quantities that low, you know? And they never really let him expand into a bigger line until ultimately he went over to Adidas. Well, I don't, like I said, I, I don't know what the deal was that he had with them. I don't know why he didn't expand or not, so it's, it's kind of hard for me to, to, to speak on it. I've only heard the disruption when he was talking about Nike at one of his, uh, maybe one of his shows or on a song or something like that. But, I mean, I don't know anything about the deal. I, I didn't have um, Kanye, he wasn't signed to me at that time for me to do that. Okay, well originally you guys started working with Kanye as a producer. Yes, so his first single was on Beanie Siegel's uh, first album, uh, The Truth. Okay, because I just interviewed Raskaz mm -hmm. uh, earlier today, and he was talking about how when he was working with Dre, when Aftermath was first starting, Kanye was over there producing. Kanye's over there making beats. Like, yeah, it's just a whole Wait, different... Kanye? Yeah, my nigga. Was, was that after, early, early Aftermath? Early Aftermath. It wasn't making even beats Aftermath. for Dre? He was, making, he was making beats. Kanye had a deal with Jay, Jay-Z, with Rockefeller. They had first right of refusal. But then if they didn't pick it, then he could make beats for whoever else. But, you know, if if, if Rockefeller approved. Because I had a song with Kanye on my third album, on my fourth album that didn't come out. That, you know, Jay Rockefeller had the right of approval. But yeah, Kanye was Kanye was there. Not no? Early on, I mean, hip hop, my, my little brother, hip hop. Um, so, you know, people that may not be familiar, hip hop since 1978. He found Kanye. So he was the A&R at the time. So he would find, he found No ID, Kanye, uh, Just Blaze, you know, just to name a few. And I mean, a host of other producers as well. Um, so when we first had him, when he brought him to us, he, he brought, it to, brought him to us as a producer. So like I said, he uh, produced on um, Beanie Siegel's uh, first album. That's, that was his first single. And I can't remember what, what was the next project after that. But um, I know once he did all of that work on, um, maybe was it uh, the, the Dynasty or the Blueprint? The Blueprint. Blueprint. Yeah. Blueprint. yeah. That's, you know, when everybody became to really know who Kanye was. Right, because I remember there was some sort of listening session that Kanye had and Jay was presenting it. And he was talking about how when he first met Kanye, he wanted to hear the beats. But yeah. Kanye just kept rapping for him. That's Kanye, yeah. Kanye will play the beat and rap to it. He'll play the beat that he made for you, and then he'll jump on the table and start rapping to the beat. So he might, you know, he might inspire a flow. He might inspire a hook or chorus um, to it. Or ultimately, he's probably really want to be on that song with you. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, yeah, Kanye was always animated. He was um, always a great artist, um, you know, I mean, obviously producer and rapper. And then, you know, as a rapper, he, he actually came into his own and, you know, now is known for, you know, one of the best. I mean, who really saw Kanye as a rapper first over there? Um, I, I, I would say hip hop probably noticed, but I, I believed in it uh, probably more than anybody on the team. Um, when I heard Kanye's album, I thought it was something that was um, ahead of his time. I didn't think that a lot of people was listening to that type of music with that type of message and sonically how it sound and lyrically what he was saying was so dope to me. Um, I just seen huge, huge potential in it. So uh, Dame liked it and he just like, well, this is dope. Let's just put everybody on the album, you know, uh, on Rockefeller and break it 
and break him um, as a group, you know, kind of like what we did with the dynasty. But um, I, I seen the genius of it, so I wanted to put it out solo. And then after chasing um, through the wire and getting so much traction on that, because I actually hired an independent radio team because Def Jam didn't believe in him neither. So I hired somebody myself, uh, actually to, uh, John from Don't Think Twice. And we had started to get traction at two radio stations, I believe, or three, well, Chicago, Baltimore, Virginia, D.C. And once we started getting, breaking into the top 10, I knew that we had something special. And then um, I got with Benny Pugh, who's the new president of Rock Nation. And um, he was doing uh, work in radio, doing promotions at Def Jam at that time. And he and I worked that record. I mean, I'll be honest, I didn't see it in the beginning. Like, when I first heard of Kanye the rapper, I'm like, okay, why is this beat maker rapping? Like, you know what I mean? Because you, you've seen that type of thing before. You always, yeah. you see, like, producers try to rap, and it, it, it you know, it sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Like, you know, I think Diamond D did a good job with it. Uh -huh. you so, know what I mean? but when you're saying you heard it, you heard the album, or you heard... No, 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 no. Like, I, I was hearing... Some of like the, the early stuff. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. With well, me yeah. being in the studio and damn near living there, you know, with, with our A&Rs and a bunch of our artists, I'm hearing a lot more. So I'm seeing the potential. I'm hearing the full body of the album. I'm listening to the album sequenced and, 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 and feeling the impact and listening to it over and over and over again. So I actually uh, picked, the, you know, the, the next two singles after that um, because I, I seen the setup. I knew what he wanted to do but I, I just figured a better way how to do it. Right, because I remember when Through the Wire came out, I'm like, huh, it's cool, it's, it's different, it's cool. And then I remember I was in the studio with Kanye and Common when they were working on, on Common's album, and Kanye played me slow jams, you know, before it came out, and I'm like, oh, okay, this is, this is what you're doing over here, yeah. okay. And then, and, and then I got it. Yeah. And then after that, it was like... I mean, Through the Wire, for me, was a huge song sonically, right? The, the beat and that hook was something. But if you knew the message behind it, it resonated with a lot of people. You know, being in a car crash and actually rapping while his mouth was wired shut. So a lot of times uh, when people, even with fashion today, right? People um, gravitate towards something once there's a story to be told where people could really buy into that lifestyle and movement. And there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot to tell with Kanye. Um, one, with his hunger, his talent, but, you know, almost dying in a car crash and having his mouth wired shut and then being relentless saying, look, I'm making this song while my mouth is wired shut and calling it through the wire. I mean, it just showed the genius that he, you know, that he was capable of. Yeah, um, you know, he, he hasn't stopped since. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and he's, he's always pushing running. And he's always pushing the envelope, you know, which yeah. I you know, which I like. So even if you think about eight oh eight or, you know, some of the other stuff that he's doing, it, people were still probably saying, Well, I don't know. You know, like he always gives you that, well, I don't know, but it it doesn't really matter as long as it's true to him. And he's um getting across the message that he wants to relay at that time. Yeah. I mean when you see where him and Jay are, are right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you see a, a resolution to this, knowing both of them so well? Um, yeah, I don't think that it's, a, I think the public is probably making it out a little more um, than what it is. Obviously, uh, Kanye went on that rant, um, but you know, Jay addressed it as well. You know I mean? It, it's love there, you know, we all brothers. So um, I don't, like I don't see this as being some huge beef that can't be squashed or anything like that, if it's not, um, if they're not speaking already. So, uh, how did Cameron and Dipset end up coming over to Rockefeller? Uh, Cam reached out to Dame, played them some music, and then Dame called me in to listen to Cam's album, which I want to say he may have 12 or 13 songs done. So, the only songs that I believe that was done to go on um, Cam's project was uh, the two biggest uh, singles, uh, Oh Boy and Hey Ma. So, oh, so Just Blaze was already working with him? No, so he played, he had his album done already, and then he did those two additional songs. So once Dane oh. played the album, you know, he called me and he was like, yo, I want to sign this. 
and I heard the album, I was like, oh shit, this shit is crazy. Like, you know, Cam is dope. I mean, everybody was always a Cam fan before that. I liked Cam as a person, you know, uh, being from Harlem and stuff, and we had a good relationship. As a rapper, I thought he was good. That album, um, I mean, he was dope to me. Right, because, let me, let me, let me just kind of think back. Before he came over to Rockefeller, he had an album already. Yeah, which is, you know, a lot of people. Through, through uh, Lance. Uh, yeah, and that first Lance, album, uh, I can't remember it, but I mean, it's, it's held as like a, a super classic, especially like, you know, Underground. Everybody, you know what I mean, kind of loved that album, the storytelling that he did. And um, it was it's funny because it was like almost like an East Coast Tyler, the creator, kind of, right? Like the way he talked about his subjects and things like that. You you kind of turn up like, wow, he just said that? You know, yeah, it was, he was, it was emotionally, it was, yeah. yeah, he evoked a lot of emotions. Yeah, no, I remember there was like a line about having sex with a girl with AIDS and yeah. stuff like that. Like yeah. that's a Tyler type of thing to, mm -hmm. to say. Okay, I never really thought about it that way, but that, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so he came over to, to Rockefeller. And then, you know, you hear the stories about the friction between him and Jay. Um, well, I mean, you, you, you would hear that like so much further down the line, but, uh, Oh, so initially that never happened. No, there was no initial problems. No. Okay. Well, what caused the problems? Well, Cam spoke about it. He said his problem with Jay was that, uh, I, I guess they didn't do a song together or whatever, you know? Right. I mean, and I remember I interviewed Petey Crack mm -hmm. and he was saying how there was, uh, I pull the CD out. I'm like, hey, Beans, look. This is joint I did. Man, check this shit out. I threw the CD in the um, deck. And I pressed play. And the same shit. When it, when it got up to camera part, this nigga Mac stand up and go walk over to the CD player, kindly ejected that shit, and broke it in half and threw it in the trash. Like, yo, get the shit out of here. I'm like, yo, what the fuck is going on? Beanie Siegel. Yeah, man. Grabbed Sorry. the CD with Cameron on the verse. I don't know why. He broke yeah. it in half. Cracked it in half and threw it in the trash. Like, let's shit out of here. And just got back to playing the game and smoking. Like, I just walked out. I'm like, yo, I don't know what the fuck is up with these niggas. I don't, I don't remember that. Everybody else, but more or less, had good relationships. It was, it was definitely competitive. Because now, I mean, so you talked about Cam and the Dipsets. Uh, the Dipset came later on after the Cam project, after Cam, you know, going platinum. But at the time, if you want to fast forward, when we got Dipset, we got State Property, and we got, you know, Bleak and Jay, right? So it's like Force and Kanye, right? Kanye is his own movement, even though he's one person. Uh, <laughs> we got all of this going on in baseline you know, two rooms, and it's everybody's trying to outdo each other. But at the time, we feel like we got the best in hip hop, which is good for us. I mean, so nobody's really beefing, but they're being competitive. Okay. But ultimately, you end up not really working out. Like, no one really squashed it. No one really got over it. It kind of lingered for, for years and years. Yeah, I mean, I, I only hear it really when Cam talks about it. Um, but other than that, I mean, Jay doesn't address it or feel, I don't think he feels any, any way about it. It's the same thing with, um, with Jim. So I forgot where I was. Oh, I was somewhere and I was talking, I think I was in a gym and I was talking to, to Jay and, uh, and I told him about something. I'm about to go meet Jim Jones or something like that. He was like, yo, tell him I said peace. So when I told Jim, Jim was like, oh shit, that's crazy, man. Like, yo, thank you, big bro. You know what I'm saying? Like, thank you for that and this and that. So, and Jay was like, yeah, tell him, like, you know, I'm way past having any problems or anything like that. You know, so that was like the beginning of everything kind of subsiding and them, uh, you know, being able to work um, together like they're doing now in the future. So even when he got the first call to go up there, Jim called me right away. He was like, Biggs, what do you think? I was like, nah, go up there, man. It'll be a good thing, you know, especially if Juan is, um, you know, trying to be the bridge for that. You got a good relationship with Juan. Juan's from Harlem, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, I kind of told him about the landscape up there, and I was like, yo, Jay's in a different place, man. Just go ahead. Um, 
um, if that can help further your career and do things outside of music, because I think that's what Rock Nation does. People, um, people look at it as one, you know, just music, but I think they can help people be a bigger brand even if they're not making music and help them do deals outside of that. I said it can help uh, prolong your career and help give you that jump start. So, well, right, because uh, your brother Hip Hop used to tell me that Dipset was his friends, like from high school. Yeah, exactly. So it's like you got people that are not getting along, but everyone in the middle is getting along, yeah. and it's kind of a weird situation. It can't be that much beef if everybody's in the studio. Right. If, if you're in the B room working and Jay's in the A room, and then we all hanging out playing pool together, I mean, how much beef is it? Yeah. You never heard, like, everybody's like, yo, they was beefing. You never heard of a fight. You never heard, like, yo, they got in an argument, you know, in the back room. Like, so how much beef was it? I mean, yeah, I mean, Cameron <laughs> jumped on that one, that one uh, record where y'all were dissing Nas. Uh -huh. And he, you know, he said some shit like, you know, R. Kelly, your daughter's face. Like, he, Cam was going harder than anybody in that beef. Like, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Like, how, how, mu how much beef was it if nobody, you know, they just saying beef, right? Everybody wants to sell something and, and, and sell some controversy. But, I mean, real beef to me isn't, you know, people walking by each other and not speaking. <laughs> right. That's right. not Violent. beef. <laughs> when you first saw that picture of Jay-Z and Jazz O uh, that just popped up the other day, yeah. what'd you think? I, I, I mean, I love that. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know if Jazz, I didn't get the full story. I don't know if Jazz performed or whatever, um, Jigga What, or, or whatever like that. But because uh, that's, that's the first thing that I seen when I came to mind, because uh, I seen it. I don't know if it was before the show or after. But when I seen that, I was like, oh, shit, Jazz, um, I wonder if he's performing or did. But, I mean, I love to see that. I love to see that. I, I didn't see that one coming. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you know, especially because, you know, you say how, how Jay don't really talk on a lot of people. He's taking a few shots of Jazz, like, along the, you know. <laughs> yeah. Every couple albums, even Jazz bum ass. Like, like it'll be like, oh, shit. Like, yeah, but like I said, that's, I mean, it's still not beef. Like, what, like beef isn't, yo, I'm, I'm throwing a, you know what I'm saying, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing a little shot at somebody on a song. You know what I'm saying? Beef is, when you see them on a the block, you, you either don't want to walk on that block because they there, or you're going to walk on that block and there's going to be a problem between both of you guys. You know what I'm saying? That's beef. That's, you know what I mean, some hip-hop shit. I mean, because I've interviewed Jazzo back in the day. I mean, it's been, it's been some years. Uh... If I remember correctly, it had something to do with, I guess you guys wanted to give him a deal at Rockefeller, but the amount wasn't to his liking, so he walked away from it? Uh, I can't remember. I know we was thinking about doing something with Jazz. I don't know what the deal was or whatever And um, at that time. But, uh, I, I, I mean, that's, that's it's so long ago, man. That's a little vague to tell you the truth. Okay. But it could, it, it, that, that could be true. Now, you guys were involved in uh, the Paid in Full movie. Mm -hmm. what, what exactly happened between uh, you guys and Harvey Weinstein? Because there's a few different stories floating around. Cam said that Dame slapped Harvey. Like, I heard from Dame's brother that, Harvey, that, that Dame barked on Harvey. Like, Dame denied it. Like, what? Did you well, see any of this? Yeah, well, I'm saying if Dame denied it, there you go, right? If everybody's talking about Dame and Dame is telling you exactly what happened, you're hearing it from the horse's mouth. So, um, nah, I wasn't, I wasn't there when he had a problem uh, with, with Harvey or if anything, um, you know, if there was any beefing. I wasn't physically there. Okay. Did you guys have an idea what you had on your hands when you did Paid in Full? I, I mean, I did. I would go because Dame had a theater in his, um, in his house. That's, we actually lived of like maybe five minutes apart at that time. And I would go every day to watch the movie. So I'm talking about from the first cut to probably, I don't know, eight or nine cuts after that. But every time I seen it, I was like, yo, this shit is a classic. This shit is a classic. This, you know, I should be there reassuring him that this movie is gonna touch a lot of people. Um, I think it was hard for him to see at that time because he wanted it to be so much better and it was a lot of things that was left out that he wanted to do 
you know, like, um, you know, I know a lot of it because of uh, budget issues was shot in Canada, which would have been preferred to be shot in Harlem or some other places um, around the United States. But uh, I, I, I seen the genius of that and I thought that he did, I mean, I still think that he did one of the best jobs um, ever. Um, it's probably the best film that came out of the camp. And it's, you know, for us, it's like that, that uh, East Coast menace of society, that thing that just kind of resonates with everybody because it was the first peek into something that happened into New York and, and gave that really Harlem flavor, like when we would see those early West Coast movies. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking right now about the, I mean, because it's not really a, a hip-hop movie. It is, but it isn't, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, it's, it's not, not about I mean, it was done by guys in hip-hop. In hip-hop, right. But, you know, but yeah, it, wasn't, it wasn't a hip-hop movie. You know, like, like I would put it above a um, Straight Outta Compton mm. or, or anything else like that. I, would I think put those it, are two different I, movies, I, too. So Straight, two different out, movies. straight so, Outta you know Compton is a hip-hop movie, and it's about the lives and careers of hip-hop artists, right? From right. The, I mean, I would put it up there with Menace to Society. Boys the Men. I mean, not Boys the Men. But, what is but, it? But, but Boys in the Hood. Boys in the Hood. Uh, right. You know, like those type of movies that um, gave us a peek into what happened in the, you know, for us on the East Coast, what was going on over there. So that, that's, that's where it stands for me. I mean, whenever we report on somebody getting shot, the camera online pops up in the comments every time. What's that? Like, you know, dudes get shot. You know, dudes get <laughs> shot every day. B, he be, he be all right. Like you know, it's like mm -hmm. you know, because I interviewed Wood Harris uh, yeah. not too long ago. Yeah. And we talked about the the significance of that movie. I feel like Paid in Full was like almost like the new Scarface yeah. of that of that era. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? I do know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Hell of a movie, and, and and you know, I interviewed Az Faison, you know, who played Wood Harris's character. Mm -hmm. And got the got the whole background. Hell, hell of a movie, man. Yeah. Hell of a hell of a fucking movie. Yeah. It was, um, a, it was a crazy time in Harlem, B. Yep. There was a, I think it may have been a Jay Z interview, where he was talking about kind of early on, uh, you know, in the Rockefeller days, you guys were supposed to go to a certain club. And there was a, a bunch of dudes in front who I guess you guys had issues with. And you were the one that said, nah, I'm good. I'm just going to go home. I'm not going to deal with this potential problem. And, and, you know, whereas most people during that time were like, well, motherfuckers, you know, we run the city. We're not going to, no one's going to tell us where we can and can't yeah, go. Yeah, I got I to correct you on that. He was talking about Biggie, not Biggs. Oh. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't, that wasn't me. No, you were you were the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> not we're going there. Fuck everybody. <laughs> not to say that Big wasn't, but that's why Jay was using that story to say that that guy was a good guy and he had a great heart, and he was just seeing that somebody who just wanted to avoid stuff. You know, when you're young, you think that running towards a problem is cool, but as you get older, you're like, look, you know, a lot of times, um, like early on, you know, everybody would go to guns you know, go to clubs with the with guns, right? And then I remember hearing somebody like, why would you go to a club where you need a gun? And then it didn't even, it was like, oh yeah. <laughs> like, you know, just for somebody to say something so simple like that, it's like, yo, why am I going to a place where I'm taking a chance of getting hurt, hurting somebody's self, or I got to defend myself? Is it worth really going to this place to have that much fun where even if any of, none of that happened, I get pulled over and now I get a charge? You know what I'm saying, which happened to a lot of uh, hip hop artists, um, you know, over the last few years. So it was a, it was a smart thing that uh, you know that that Big was saying. But you know, when you're young and you're a little reckless, uh, you think different. I mean, Biggie, it to a... Biggie, not Bigs, Biggie. Okay, it happened to Plasco Burris actually. <laughs> yeah. You know, go go into a club with a gun when you have no business. Yeah. You don't even have a per you don't even have a permit, mm -hmm. a carry permit, and then you go and shoot yourself, go to jail, <laughs> and your whole career is over after that. Yeah, man. All all because of one egotistical decision. Yeah. There was a battle between Jay Z and LL Cool J. 
Yeah, that was early on. I wasn't there for that neither. I think, I believe it was in front of the Palladium. Um, okay. In, in New York on 14th Street. But yeah, that was a, a legendary moment. I wasn't, I wasn't there for that, but I, I, you know, I heard about it. Yeah. You weren't there, but was this during the Rockefeller days or early on? Uh, the prequel. So that was uh, before Rockefeller. Okay. So, so him rhyming that with, with Big L was pre-Rockefeller and even the battle with DMX. I, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is by that time, Cool J was a superstar. Yeah, 100%. So, so why, why is he battling an up-and-coming dude? I think Jay called him out. Mm. So from what I know of, Jay called him out once he came. Um, they both came out of the club and Jay called. I mean, Jay, was, Jay wanted to battle anybody then. He was, you know, really trying to, trying to make a name. Right, well, it makes sense why Jay would want to do it. Mm -hmm. But LL. Yeah, because I, I believe Jay called him out and started rapping. So it was already like too late. He already, <laughs> he already drew him in. Uh, damn, too bad there's no uh, video phones back then. Imagine yeah. that, that battle on, uh, on video. Yeah, Clark Kent was there. I know that. Okay, I'm going to ask him about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Clark. Okay. Um, so you ended up selling, you know, Rockefeller and everything, you know, the, the three of you guys sort of went your separate ways. You ended up, you know, doing uh, Dame Dash Music Group and so forth. And then you, got, you had that, that marijuana bust. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's interesting because now you can legally grow marijuana where I am right now in, in California mm -hmm. and in a lot of different states. New York is, I think it's just medical marijuana? I believe so. Okay. So, I mean, number one, why were you growing marijuana at the time? Um, I actually wasn't growing marijuana. Aha. Okay. Yeah. So what happened was I, it was a conspiracy because I connected somebody from New York to a farmer in uh, California. I was actually buying dispensaries and I was going to buy, I was looking to purchase some of these farmers' houses as well to sell to the dispensaries, thinking I'm building a vertical business. But in that time, it takes three, six or nine months to get up and running. So a friend of mine asked me to connect them with somebody and because they connected, even though they didn't do a deal, they spoke about it on the phone, that's a conspiracy. And I conspired because I connected them. So you connected a friend or someone you knew mm -hmm. to buy a grow house in, in yeah, they, California? Yeah, they was, they was gonna do whatever, you, you know, I, I connected them, I was like, look, this is him, this is him, it's all good. You know, you guys kind of take it from there. That's a conspiracy. Okay, and his phone was being tapped. Exactly. Okay, so you're not even involved in none of this shit. This is just... No, so what happened is because uh, I had a felony already, um, I was facing 10 years just being attached to that case. So uh, I'm the one with probably the most notoriety because I'm the only one doing anything I wouldn't say the only one. It was like 60-something people arrested. I'm not sure of everybody, but I was, you know, probably the main focus of doing something legal. So when um, everything happened, I'm on the front page of the po post. I'm on the front page of um, MTV, blog, CNN, and everything else. So they used me to bring notoriety to the case. And um, because there was something called a, a mandatory minimum, triggered at 100 uh, kilos, they attribute what they think you did a part of the case. So if I connect you and I say, Vlad, here's my friend, the farmer, right, Jake the farmer, and you say, okay, yo, I want to buy 100 kilos from him, right, which is what, roughly 220 pounds, that's a conspiracy right there. Whether that happens okay. or not, you conspired to do it, and I helped connect you guys. Okay, so you got hemmed up with 60-something people. Yeah. And this was all, they are all doing marijuana shit, essentially? Th that's what the shit? case was, yeah. Okay. So, so here you are, a multimillionaire, mm -hmm. with one of the biggest brands in music. <laughs> Clothing, mm -hmm. liquor, yeah. artists who are still prominent today. And now you're sitting here looking at this stupid-ass situation. Yeah. <laughs> 
go and like, I mean, and, I, and your lawyer, lawyer is telling you he's not going to be able to fully get you out of it. Um, no, he was trying. And then, um, you know, like I took a lie detector test that showed that I had um, like nothing to do with anything that they were talking about. But it's up to their, um, it's up to them whether they want to use it or not. So even the guy who took the lie detector test was an extra, uh, um, an ex-federal agent that worked at Guantanamo Bay. So he was more than reputable. Uh, the DEA said that they wouldn't use that because anything, if they say it's 99.9 kilos, there's no mandatory minimum. And then the judge could say, okay, he could go on probation. So that hundred straddles the line. You know, why isn't it 99.9? Why isn't it a grant? Like, how do you know? And you, you guys don't have any of the stuff that you said that these guys conspired to do. So why would it be a hundred, you know? Okay. So for me, it was, uh, I, I, it came to a point where I could take five years, I can go to court, um, fight, and possibly get uh, 10 or 20 years, or I can tell. So I, I chose to take five years. Oh, so they said if you give us a bunch of other names, we'll make this go away. Yeah. And you refused. Yeah. Wow. Not a lot of people in your financial position would have done that. Um, yeah, probably, you know. So you end up having to go to jail for five years. You did the full five years? Yeah, well, you do, you know, from that, I did, yeah, about four. Okay. How, how did it feel to, to go from, you know, private jets and popping Cristal to suddenly being in a, in a cage with men around? Um, I think you get, it doesn't matter what environment that you're in, you get used to it and you adapt, you know. So we're uh, creatures of habitat, right? So I got into something and I mean, I wasn't, um, it wasn't nothing that was foreign to me. I knew a lot of friends um, that did time before and things like that, um, you know, end up going in and knowing people in there as well. So, you, you know, you adapt. Okay. Like what was the hardest part about doing those four years? Uh, probably missing my family. So even when you make these decisions, legal or not, um, even though you may be straddling, straddling the line, right? Because at that time, California wasn't where it was today. You know, even though the, the law was, uh, it was r loosely written um, and knowing that something could happen, but not thinking about it, you're not thinking about the effect that it has on your family, friends, the community, and the people who really rely on you. So um, even though as a man, I'm thinking like, look, I can get through that. I, you know, I'm strong enough to do, you know, most things or strong enough that most people, uh, you don't think about the effect that it has on them. So I guess you were born again when you were in prison? Yeah, uh, my last year. Okay, what triggered that? Uh, I had a uh, talk with a friend, one of my best friends, uh, actually Chip, and I wanted to talk to him about business and he chose to talk to me about the Lord. So we had this six hour conversation and that night things changed for me and I wanted to hear more about it. So we started to build a fellowship. We would sit down and talk about uh, scriptures in the Bible, what it meant to us and things like that. And um, I started to stray from being an atheist to um, becoming a Christian. Okay, I mean, were you raised Christian when you were younger? Uh, my mother was, yeah, but it wasn't something practiced in the household. It was probably practiced through uh, how she was living, but not how she wasn't teaching that to us, but showing it more through, an, through examples. Okay, so you became religious in your last year in prison, and then you got I out. I want to say, uh, you know, that's a... It's another conversation. I don't know if we want to go there, but I wouldn't say it's a religious thing. I, I, I believed in God, right? I believed in Jesus. Yeah. Okay. What, what changed about your life when, that, when you made that transformation? Um, reflecting, you know, you start thinking about the past, uh, things that you could have did different, um, things, people you might have treated different, business decisions you might have made that was different. It's just, I think, um, a lot of reflection. 
Yeah, I mean, even, I, I interviewed... Uh, even with, with your family on how they was raised and things like that? Yeah, I mean, I interviewed Lecrae recently. Oh, know, really? the prominent uh, Christian. I, well, I heard about him during that last year of prison. Mm. And because um, usually, you know, I, you get a lot of that, oh, I can rap or this and that, or even guys in prison, like, listening to stuff. But I didn't know he had the skill set that he had. He's, he's, yeah, he's a skilled rapper. Yeah, Lecrae's dope. Yeah. Lecrae, Lecrae is really dope. Yeah, so and, you know, we had a, we had a real a real deep conversation. Like, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll send you some of those links if, if that, that's okay. what interests you. You know what I mean? We talked about, like, you know, for example, like, like Tupac's thoughts about the black church, mm -hmm. you know, and how, how he felt it was, it was, you know, it somewhat took advantage of certain communities. You talk about how one of your, one of your heroes is Tupac. Yeah. Now, now, Tupac did speak against the black church. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there was a, like a Vibe interview, I think, that was kind of like a famous interview that he did. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of, I think hip hop does that because hip hop, because the black church really hasn't embraced or been present in hip hop. You know what I'm saying? Like hasn't really walked alongside of hip hop. It's, it's kind of like chastised them from afar. I'm, I'm sure I'll meet him one day, but um, I'm definitely a fan of his. I assume you heard uh, Jay's 444? Of course, yeah. What did you think about it the first time you heard it? Um, well, the first time I heard it, I was at his house, and um, I probably heard, I don't know, seven, eight songs or something like that, um, and the rest, I probably heard uh, the other four or five was just uh, beats, but uh, I, I, I liked it. Um, I didn't love it. Um, I was seeing, you know, I heard where he was going um, lyrically, so I, I heard it uh, maybe two times, right? He played it. And then, uh, you know, I reached back out to him and I was discussing and he was like, look, I'm, you know, I would love your feedback. Like, you know, of course you out of most people. And then, um, it was a, a beat that he, <laughs> he was trying to get, uh, well, I talked about Bink and he was like, yeah, man, I wanted to get, get something from Bink, but, um, I don't have time to, you know, to spend with him. So I had reached out to Bink and then sent Jay Beats and, that next day, he was like, "Yo, like, how are you being? How are you able to get these beats? And I'm trying to get get them for so long." And um, I mean, Bank had something that was really, really dope that was about to make it, but I guess Jay at that time having uh, 11 or 12 records all done by No ID, he wanted to kind of go with one producer. So the second time when I came out to LA, when he was doing uh, uh what's the Damn, that smile. What's the song that he does? Um, he did on Saturday Night Live with uh, I Apologize. Uh, oh, 444, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I heard the, the track to that, and then we listened to the album again, and then it, it, it like immediately started to hit me and getting that classic feel. So not only with the, uh, the lyrics, but where no ID was kind of driving the direction of the album sonically, uh, it, it, it started to hit me in a different way. And especially seeing Jay open up and be vulnerable like that. I mean, you always give a little piece, like one of the last songs on the album, or Regrets, uh, Mama, uh, Mama Loves Me, uh, you know, or, you know uh, or his songs he talk about his father, but not a whole entire project. So I thought that was dope. Well, this is the first time ever that Jay worked with one producer. Yeah. I mean, first, first and foremost, like it's always been. I mean, you guys have your go-to guys, but they're yeah. they do a couple songs each, and you know, you you hop around. Uh, any idea why he decided to just go with just no ID on this entire project? Um, I, th they were just working closely together, and no ID was doing something where he was like chopping the beats in some weird way. That was crazy because I think they even talked about trying to have somebody play it over and, and the, the band was like, yo, it's too complicated. So Jay just loved exactly, you know, what he was bringing. So I think um, Jay was actually, the samples that he loved too, uh, he was given to No ID for songs that really resonated with him. And then he was able to, to, to bring that together and into like this hip hop form that Jay could rap over. Um, 
not just a you know old soul song. Well, the the story of OJ seems to be the standout on that project. That's the one that everyone kind of lost their mind over. As someone who who takes finances very very carefully, you know, very seriously, who invests in stocks, who I've also invested in art and stuff like that. To hear to hear someone of Jay's caliber talk about financial freedom, talking about living leaving uh, money to his kids you know, talking about how silly the money phone is and talking about how missing certain real estate investments, like, I thought that was amazing. I thought that actually created, you know, waves in the yeah. community. Mm -hmm. I, and I think it's something that we probably won't know the impact until years from now was the snowball effect, how it's reaching people and how they're um, uh, thinking about fiscal responsibility in a different way. Um, but once you have something, a song like that or an album, is different than somebody telling you because every time it plays, it's like, oh, yeah, that, right? So it's something that's, that's kind of repetitive that you might want to just listen to and then you, you grab certain nuggets off of it. So that's why uh, another reason why I think it's genius. I think Jay just wanted to push the culture in a different way. Like I said, that, reflect, that reflecting, right? You think about everything you, you've done and you're like, well, what's my legacy? You know, what do I want it to be? How do I really want to impact? Do I want, you know, people uh, to know me, you know, like Biggs? Or I want people to know that I was the first person that, to discover platinum or rose gold or black diamonds? Or do I want to say, look, I want to bust down these doors and open it for you guys or say, you know, you can do things this way. You don't have to go to the club with a gun. You don't have to be, you know, the tough guy all the time. Just go and have fun, live your life, take care of your children and try to do right. Right, because I actually started a, an Instagram account called Vlad Stocks, mm -hmm. where I, I basically I lay out my, my own stock portfolio and I, uh, you know, talk about, you know, sort of the, the basics, the basic fundamentals of stock investing, you mm -hmm. know, without selling anything or any, yeah. any sort of upsell into this, you know, this type of situation, just because I realized that our community has no idea about stock investing. Mm -hmm. I tweeted something that kind of resonated a lot. Uh -huh. You know, and got got hundreds of comments. Was that I said the rich kids grow up watching their parents invest in stocks. Poor kids grow up watching their parents play the lotto. Mm -hmm. That's I mean, that's dope. You know, especially being able like as as, as guys with the platform, right? Like you, as guys like me, who's doing these interviews. Um, you know, t to drop these nuggets to kids. That's the only way things are going to change. It was this, um, hope I'm saying it right. I know it was this experiment. My friend Chip talked about it all the time that they was doing with, uh, with rats, right? Trying to change the, uh, the behavior. And they would, you know, they would cage rats and they would feed them different and do different things inside the cage and have different maze uh, for them to run around to, to try to change the behavior. And it wasn't until they changed the outside of the cage that the rats started, or the, or the mice, started to react differently. So a lot of times, you know, people think about doing something different, in, you know, inside, but instead of thinking about the bigger picture, how do you change what's, what's going on in, in, the in the environment, right? Not only what's happening in the home, so when you step out, you know, there's all these different programs, there's different people to talk to, there's mentors, things that you can do. It's hot, kind of hard to, to change what's happening. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the problem is, is in, you know, when you talk about the, the community in general, there is, like patience isn't really pushed. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, like Trust me, I know, that's, that's something I struggle with. Yeah, I, th I think we all do to a certain degree. But, but there's definitely, uh, you know, like for example, like with all my investments, I talked about how I bought Google in 2011 for $250 a share and it's quadrupled since then, but yeah. it's taken six years. Yeah. And people look at it and say, six years, I ain't got that, you know, fuck that. that. That's all you made in six years? Like I, I could have doubled that and flipped that and so forth in, in a week. Yeah. And it's like, well... Yeah, and there, there was three distinctive times in my life where I've put a bunch of my savings into some risky shit, mm. whether it's illegal or a friend who's got some sort of special hookup or whatever, and end up essentially losing it all. Yeah. 
And th there's, a, there's a mentality with people who don't have a lot of money to do that over and over again. And the lottery ticket mentality is that. You buy these lottery tickets when, and you lose money essentially every time, but mm -hmm. you keep buying them as opposed to actually putting money into something that's going to grow over time. Yeah. I know. It's, it, it's probably hard to see people, I mean, especially in the stock market, unless you specifically concentrating on a long or a short, right? But you look at the S&P and, and what, the, um, what, the, what the NASDAQ is doing, it is a long-term play. So if you look at the average over 10 or 15 years or even five or six years, you can see what that percentage is and kind of narrow in and say, okay, wow, that in seven years, it's, it's grown 8%. So I'm going to make 8% of my money when you know that the interest rates are damn near zero right now. So having money in the bank, you're not going to get anything for, right? right? So a lot of times, yeah, you got to look at that. And then, and then there's diversification as well, right? So stocks may be one thing, and then you may be investing in something else as well while you're running business or having, having a job. So, I mean, there's so many different ways to, um, to do it. But um, like you said, I think the, uh, you know, the people in our communities need to be educated, you know, um, before, right. they I mean, can, before they can even make those decisions because then it becomes the lotto with the stocks. <laughs> you, right. know, you, you start just kind of throwing money away and thinking that you know how to, um, how to do things. Right. Or, or like, for example, Bitcoin, you know, like there are stories of people that are taking out mortgages for Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, the, that space is hot, right? But Bitcoin is probably like the gold standard. But the ICOs and the cryptocurrency is something a lot different, right? So every day there's new ICOs, which is, you know, for the people out there, initial coin offerings, just like a, a initial public offering for IPO. But people are doing that every day, and I think it's going to bust. I think that bubble is, is going to bust, and maybe those probably 50 to 200 companies are stand still, the ones that's doing right by their investments. Um, but a lot of people are taking money in and just being frivolous with it and spending it on all type of things and not really invested in anything that has to do with the business. So, you know, it, it'll, it'll bust, but I think Bitcoin um, will live. I don't know if it's gonna, uh, at the, the price that it is now, which I think is around 19,200 today, um, up from 17,000 a couple days ago. I mean, we're seeing it. They're saying it's going to reach 100,000, but it's hard to say. I, I actually don't play in that. Um, I've never, you know, did any mining or <laughs> anything like that. But, you know, I, I pay attention to what's going on. The thing about money is that more, what's more important than actually making money is preserving what you have. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, when you reach a certain point, you know, you're trying to preserve your wealth, so you're you're doing things where you, where it doesn't have a potential for you to lose it all. Like for example, like I, I put up my, you know, I, I made a comment the other day that's saying that since I invested in in, in 2011, I've lost money one year, and I lost two percent of my portfolio yeah. in 2016. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I, you know, and. Very, some years I've made like, you know, maybe 12%, yeah. sometimes I made four, sometimes, I mean, so this year I think I'm up around 40%. You so know, it's, this is like I said, it's the average, year. right? Yeah, yeah. so. Yeah, yeah. But, but the fact that I've never done anything to lose very much of my initial investment. Mm -hmm. Whereas before I had a certain amount of money, I was constantly doing shit that made me lose huge yeah. chunks. I mean, all of, I think most people, did, especially, you know, people that was new, you know, to money, right? And you start thinking about all type of things. Um, so just like you said, art, I started investing in art myself in 2001. So I became, a, you know, a pretty sizable art collector, relatively speaking, to my crew. Um, mm. So a lot of those artists that Jay talk about now and stuff like that was some of the people that I was buying into early on. Um, but then I still look back, just, um, you know, I'm Dumbo too. So there was Basquiat paintings that I could have probably got for a couple hundred grand. That's probably, I want to say probably about eight to 12 million now that I didn't buy, you know, so. Yeah, but you know, there's probably also some other pieces for a couple hundred grand that aren't worth anything now. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And you know, cause I actually, I had a pretty sizable uh, Keith Haring collection. 
oh, okay. of, of signed prints, not not the originals. I wasn't, yeah, but I wasn't prints, quite there yeah. yet. It doesn't matter. Prints make. You no, know, I mean, yeah, yeah. Some of the prints were up 25, 30 grand a yeah. piece. You know, yeah. what I mean, and I and I built up a, a set. I think I had maybe six or seven. That's how me and Swizz actually became real cool. We started. Mm -hmm. we're, we're both Herring fans. Yeah. And um, just this year, I said, "Fuck it, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna sell it all." So, the amount of money that Christie's auction house took when they sold my pieces. Usually ten percent, right? Eight to nah. ten. Well, it's like twenty-five percent. Well, it depends on how you negotiate because they'll throw in fees of the marketing, the ads, right. and things like right. that. And then right. they take and money from the seller and the buyer. Right. So Right. Yeah. And and they, they convinced me to, to, to list these pieces at a lower rate without <laughs> actually mentioning to me that once they sell way above that, they get an even higher percentage, like a bonus yeah. percentage. Yeah. On top of that, you also have to, when it comes to art, you have to get it insured. Yeah. So you have an insurance cost, like an mm -hmm. overhead. Mm -hmm. Every uh, every year, yeah. Um, transporting it is seriously fucking expensive. Yeah, you know, as one art collector to another. Yeah. So when Jay mentioned that, I'm like, okay, I, I get what he's saying, but he's leaving out some important details along the way in the in the art world. You know well, what I mean? So I, th I think he's just trying to, like I said, tell people yeah. to 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 use their money to buy, you know, to buy other things than what they're doing right now. And, and showing that he put his money in something that he plans on leaving for his kids. Right, and, and I, think, I think that's the most important thing because once you, once you get into the mentality of saving as opposed to consuming, once mm -hmm. you figure out yeah. ways where your money is making money, where you have a business partner who's your money, mm -hmm. and your business partner is working every day to make you more money. Yeah. You start, you stop looking for things to buy. Mm hmm Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I know exactly what like, you're saying. Like, when it's just sitting there in your bank account, earning 0.001% interest, <laughs> and essentially losing money from inflation yeah. every year, yeah. you start looking at that Rolex again. Exactly. You start, you start looking at that <laughs> Bentley. Yeah. You, you know, you're like, yeah. it's, it starts really burning a hole in your pocket. But yeah. when you start thinking like, well, okay, yeah, I, I, I could... I could buy that Benz for whatever, 50 grand, but that same 50 grand might turn to 60 grand at the end of the year. Yeah. Whereas the 50 grand in the Benz will turn to 25 grand at the end of the year. Exactly. So I'm essentially losing 35 grand mm -hmm. by buying the Benz yeah. as opposed to investing this money. Yeah, and I think that's what Jay's doing. He's trying to correct the market, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. So early on, as we don't lease, we buy the whole car as you should. I don't think I would ever buy a car again <laughs> unless it's probably a Ferrari or something like that that I know that appreciates, right? right. So there's certain models that you know you could kind of get it and also make money off of. But, I mean, leasing, why wouldn't anybody lease, you know? You all, could, all I do is lease. Yeah, you can still buy, buy the car for a couple, you know, you know, for a couple more thousand dollars, but at the same time, you're not tied into it. My, my Tesla is leased, the, yeah. the Maserati I had was leased, mm -hmm. the, my, all my BMWs have been leased. Yeah. I haven't bought a car since like high school. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There's really no purpose of it. And you could write off all the, all the payments because essentially it's 100% tax deductible. Yeah. It's, it's a lot to it, man. And I feel like we have not done a good enough job, our generation has not done a good enough job educating the younger generation about finances. Yeah. Well, it starts with a spark, right? So Jay has sparked a conversation in music one way. You know, it's guys like you that sparking a conversation another way with your platform. So, I mean, even before us, I don't really remember anybody. So now it's, you know, now we can start naming people like, well, this guy and this guy, and hopefully that'll carry on. So, um, you know, I, w I, I don't want to talk about like what's not happening. Let's talk about what's happening and see if we can try to change some minds, right? All it takes is one person and we don't know, you know, and that snowball effect may hit millions. You never know who comes out of it by listening to this podcast or hearing other people talk or, or Jay's music. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I literally watch people copy my stock trades mm -hmm. in my comments. You know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. DM me, say, yo, I just bought Netflix too. Oh yeah, I, I, when you bought Amazon, I bought Amazon. Yeah. And I'm like, yo, this is, this is dope. That's like, hot, is, right? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I mean, especially since, yeah. like I said, I'm not selling anything. Like, yeah. 
it's really something that's changed my life and I felt it was my responsibility to just let people know because it's really, it's not that difficult. You know what I'm saying? Like for, for example, we talked about this last time, you know, being, being a sneakerhead and being really into Nike and Jordan, I saw what happened when Kanye went to Adidas. So in 2016, I sold all my Nike stock. That did not mean that I was some super financial guru. I just understood that what the company was doing. And anybody who was a sneakerhead had the exact same knowledge that I did and understood that Nike is not where it was a few years before then. Well, and you're buying pieces th- of companies. Yeah, well, I think you probably have a little more insight because you knew the power of Kanye. A lot of people do, though. No, I'm just saying, but you, we, we're talking about people outside the community who might be invested in Nike. Exactly. Might not even know the hell Kanye is. Like, okay, this guy, this rapper just left. So. <laughs> who cares? Yeah, yeah, so what? Yeah, we're investing in a Fortune 500 or 100 company. Who cares? Right. And, you know, what I tell people is that for the price of a pair of Jordans with tax, you could buy four shares of Nike right now. Mm-hmm. So. You're not doing music anymore. You're you're strictly yeah. other ventures. I mean, they they're trying to pull me back in. I'm getting <laughs> 300 DMs every day. Everybody's you know, you know. <laughs> I, I, I started um, I don't know why I started signing um, my Instagram on boxes at the Rock 96. So now everybody's hitting me up like, yo, music, 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 and um, they're trying to pull me back in, man, but. That's not where my passion is right now. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm happy what we, what we built. I'm happy to help people. And I, and I speak to a lot of managers, um, you know, artists that reach out all the time, um, different executives. Um, but right now, that's not what I, you know, who knows with the future? You know, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave it open. I won't, I won't close the book. What is your main passion? I mean, as someone who sat in studios and watched some of the greatest albums ever, being put together like like what really drives you right now business Hmm. so i mean i'm doing it's it's a lot that i can't talk about at this moment but i'm doing a lot of stuff outside of lifestyle um and definitely fashion i mean that's what people are seeing right now because that's you know obviously what i'm promoting at the at the time or people other people are right wearing my product because you know we, we're doing some quality things and some cool stuff right now but i'm doing a lot of stuff outside of that and hopefully when that stuff starts to turn around i could come back and talk about that and talk about fiscal responsibility in another way and talk about investments that i'm doing um outside of uh lifestyle or fashion hey man listen whatever whatever you've been involved in has ultimately been exceptional. So uh, I'm really looking forward to see what else uh, you uncover, <laughs> you know, in 2018. Yeah, me too, man. So, Can't wait. Yeah, man. Well, Biggs, always, uh, always a pleasure. Glad we ran into each other recently so we yeah. can make this happen again. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, big fan of everything you've done, man. And, you know, uh, congratulations. Thank you, man. I appreciate that, man. You know, the, the impact, the impact you made. And, you know, you know, because talk, you, you talked about how, uh, you know, like the story of OJ about leaving things to your children. In our last interview, you talked about. I'm never letting go reasonable doubt. You're never going to sell it? No. Why is that? I mean, that's something I hold dear to my heart. So it's yeah. not even about the money. Um, it's about the thing that, that put me in a different space. And, you know, as I keep talking about um, all the things, the relationships that got built, the businesses that got built, uh, uh, the frame of mind that came from that, the lifestyle I was living, um, is something that I, you know, that I that I wanted to be a part of um, for the rest of my life, and I'll probably just pass that down to my son. Yeah. That's that's really dope, man. Make sure you write in some shit that where he can't sell it himself. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, he gonna you. meet a girl, you know, right around 35 and lose yeah. his mind and suddenly start. Yeah, Start partying yeah, with gonna, shit, you yeah, know what we, I mean? We're going we to make sure he's right. My son is smart, though, so I think he'll do the right thing. <laughs> yeah, man, women will make you do some dumb shit, though. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So, <laughs> yeah, Big shout out right to Remo. Yeah, man, absolutely. Biggs, man, we'll talk soon. All Appreciate right, thanks, Vlad.